This is IAQ Radio, indoor air quality radio, the voice of the indoor air quality industry, with your host, Radio Joe Hughes, and the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick. And now, Radio Joe Hughes. Good day and welcome to IAQ Radio Plus. It's episode 718. This week, we welcome Dr. Paul Wargaki, Dr. Wen Zhen Wei, and Dr. Corinne Mandon. We're going to talk about deep energy retro, retrofits and IEQ. Uh, we call this a European tail. Uh, and tail stands for thermal, acoustic, indoor air, and luminous. Before we get started, let's thank our sponsors. They're the reason we can continue doing the show. IAQ Radio Plus Marquee Sponsor is First On Site Property Restoration at firstonsite.com. IAQ Radio Association Sponsors are ACGIH, the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists at ACGIH.org. AIHA, the American Industrial Hygiene Association at AIHA.org. IICRC, the Institute for Inspection, Cleaning, and Restoration Certification at IICRC.org. The Restoration Industry Association, RIA, at restorationindustry.org. The Environmental Information Association, EIA at EIA-USA.org. IAQ Radio Industry Sponsors are Particles Plus at ParticlesPlus.com, Tramex Meters at TramexMeters.com, and Healthy Indoors Magazine at HealthyIndoors.com. And now you can win a cool prize. It's time for the IAQ Radio Trivia Question. Be the first to correctly answer. Simply email your answer to czlotnik at cs.com. Or if listening live, just text your answer from your computer. And now, here's the Z-Man. Hello, everyone. Congratulations go out to Dawn Weeks, Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, who was first to correctly identify aflatoxin B1 as the most toxic and carcinogenic mycotoxin that's been directly correlated with causing liver cancer in multiple animal species. Here's today's IAQ Radio trivia question. What is EN1990-EN1999? hyphen en Back to you, Joe. Okay. Paul Orgaki is a professor at the Technical University of Denmark. Dr. Wen Jen Wei is a research scientist at the Scientific and Technical Center for Building in France. And Corinne Mandon, Dr. Corinne Mandon is a, she coordinated the French Indoor Air Quality Observatory Research Program and currently is with the French Institute for Radiation Protection and Nuclear Safety, where she leads the epidemiology research group. All three were a part of the paper we're going to talk about today on TAIL. Let's start with Paul. Welcome back. Great to have you. Um, we met uh, in person, finally, at the uh, Chemistry of the Indoor Environments a few months back. And um, you told me we ought to do this, talk to you and your your, your cohorts here today. Um, why do you think this is such an important topic, Paul? Well, this is my personal, of course, opinion, and uh, but I hope that our guests and also our audience will share it, is that uh, we lack a uh, standard metric for indoor environmental quality. And this is why it's so important. Uh, in today's life, we are using uh, key performance indicators for nearly everything. And the lack of the key performance indicator for indoor environmental quality that is uh, agreed by the industry and by the research to use cause that uh, we are staying behind in the innovation development. Uh, this does not allow us to compare across different you know, environments and buildings and so on. So this is why we believe that uh, today's uh, hmm, program is so important because it is an attempt, we'll be presenting it an attempt to sort of standardize it and propose the solution to this, which uh, we will talk about it, uh, how uh, good it is, and uh, we believe it's good, and uh, which will start the process of uh, standard uh, quantification or rating of the indoor environmental quality across buildings, not only in the US, but also in Europe and maybe other parts of the world. 
And why? I, I'm assuming this was a part of a deep energy retrofit like program or something like that. Why exactly did you go with standardizing indoor environmental quality issues with respect to deep energy retrofits? Well, I, actually, it, the, the whole idea was raised during the project, uh, which was called Aldran. And the idea about the, behind the project was to intensify, or uh, provide the incentives for intensifying the process of energy retrofit of buildings in Europe, specifically focusing on offices and hotels. So um, European Union has a very ambitious targets of uh, uh, reducing the use or uh, emission of CO2 and of course the use of fossil fuels and uh, making the building buildings you know energy uh, low energy. Um, and however, this process of retrofit and uh, energy retrofit is um, very slow. Um, uh, because it's costly also. So um, our project was supposed to look for the incentives for the potential investors, um, uh, building owners and so on, uh, on how to, uh, um, where to find additional benefits uh, from uh, um, a retrofit. And one of the benefits is, of course, if you uh, retrofit the building, um, uh, ordinary building, you may at the same time change the indoor environmental quality. It, the, the change can happen in either direction. It can actually reduce indoor environmental quality or can improve. But the idea was that if we can quantify that there is any uh, change in indoor environmental quality, we can then perhaps provide the economic benefit that is uh, connected with this change. So for that purpose, we had to develop um, a metric or uh, the rating scheme that uh, would allow us to uh, to uh, to quantify or rate the indoor environmental quality. And then we didn't plan to develop the uh, the rating scheme. We hope that there is a rating scheme that uh, would uh, uh, do the job. So. Uh, so our starting point was to go into the literature, find out what is used in the measurements, and maybe there is a, some metric that we could uh, uh, apply, and we couldn't find any. Um, actually, what we found is uh, more than maybe 80, 90 different uh, measuring uh, uh, param parameters that are measured when uh, people are measuring indoor environmental quality and uh, no standard approach and so on and so on. So then we decided basically um, to um, to develop our own rating scheme uh, rather than to adapt whatever that is uh, on the market. And uh, we started with defining, of course, the, the principles of this and objectives and so on and so on. We can talk about it in a moment. But uh, so originally the idea came up from the energy retrofits. So we were trying to develop the rating scheme that would be specifically used for uh, in the process of energy retrofit. But in the end, we have a rating scheme that actually can be applied uh, in any context. Um, Dr. Wei. And uh, Corinne wants to. Yeah, Corinne oh, sorry, wants to, uh, please, Dr. Manning, please jump in. Yeah, thank you, Joe. Um, uh, to in your introduction, you, you mentioned that I coordinated the French Indoor Air Quality Observatory. And um, in 2012, we started a, a research program within this observatory dedicated to uh, indoor air quality in uh, new energy efficient buildings and retrofitted buildings. And we observed at that time that there could be two, um, two problems with uh, retrofitted buildings, namely uh, high mold, development of mold and uh, dampness. And the second problem could be radon because uh, the air build, uh, the building envelope is is tighter uh, because of energy retrofit and uh, new new roof, new walls, or new insulation materials. But uh, if ventilation is not correctly managed, especially if there is no mechanical ventilation, that is very common in European building, uh, the, the dampness is trapped in the building and cannot be evacuated and mold can develop. And radon is still coming from the, the ground below the building and is trapped in the building and not because air change, there is no air leakage anymore. Uh, the radon is radon concentration may increase so that's this is these two problems 
that that made us think that we need to include uh, indoor air quality and more largely indoor environmental quality when we are thinking of energy retrofit. So when the Aldrin project was, uh, that Pavel just mentioned, when this Aldrin project uh, was uh, developed, we immediately thought that we, we need, we absolutely needed to include IAQ in the energy, deep energy retrofit program to avoid these such problems. And so maybe Good. for the uh, uh, American listeners, uh, so I think it's very important to create also a, a background here. So in Europe, the uh, retrofit of buildings, so energy retrofit of buildings should follow the frame that is developed by the European Commission, which is called EPBD, which is Energy Performance of Building Directive. So each country can develop its own um, way of how to retrofit the buildings, but the general frame... Uh, is defined by this EPBD and um, or this directive. And this directive actually say says, uh, it didn't say it in the first version, but in the uh, amendment, then the second version says that uh, any, any energy retrofit uh, of the building should not uh, aggravate the conditions for the building occupants, meaning that there should be no cons negative consequences for health and comfort without defining what is meant by the health and comfort and how to quantify it. But uh, basically, there is this statement there. And of course, in order to do this, you have to measure indoor environmental quality, but the rating has did not exist at that time. So that was also one of the reasons why the rating was developed, is just to at least um, uh, monitor and con confirm that the there is no aggravation or reduction of the indoor environmental quality due to the process. And let's let's get uh, Dr. Wei on here. I, you know, yes, you, sure, sure, sure. you started out in, in China, got your PhD in civil engineering from, from China and then moved on in, and, and are now working in, in France. How does the building uh, construction type change? Like here in the, in the States, We've got a lot of wood construction, you know, metal buildings, et cetera. And my understanding, I've never been in Europe, but my understanding in Europe and, and in China as well, you've got a lot more concrete type construction. How how does that change the way you look at indoor environmental quality? Or, or is this something that you've developed that could work across any kind of construction? Well, so uh, I'm, a, as you said before, I'm a doctor in civil, en civil engineering, so I was specialized in indoor quality. And, and during my PhD at Tsinghua University, China, and uh, National Institutes of Standards and Technology, U.S., I mainly worked on volatile organic compounds emissions from building materials, uh, different types of building materials in, found on the Chinese market and on the U.S. market. And after my PhD, I joined the Scientific uh, uh, scientific and Technical Center for Building in France, says to be France. So I started working on the materials that we can find on the European market, and especially the different types of buildings. At CSTB, we coordinate, uh, we work on the French Observatory of Indoor Air Quality. So in this observatory, we work on different types of buildings, the, the dwellings, including the apartment buildings and uh, the, the individual housing, and also the different uh, schools and offices. So all this gives me a, a, a broad idea of the different type of buildings in France, in China, in the US, there are some similarities and differences and, and also allowed me to expand my research area from indoor air quality to indoor environmental quality in general. And do you think what you've developed, we'll talk, we'll get more detail on tail in a moment, but do you think this will work in any environment, in any type of, you know, climate? Uh, the, when we designed the tail, it was a European project, and we mainly focused on the in, uh, on the European uh, Europe to to be aligned with the European uh, regulations and and standards, and also aligned with the European climate. But this methodology, I would say that it can it can be adapted to different type of use in different type of buildings and environments. All right, let, let's go into a little more detail on on tail and, and what that what that stands for. It's thermal, acoustic, indoor air, and luminous. Um, thermal, I think we're all pretty familiar with, but let's let's expand on that just a little bit. 
we're you know we're looking at deep energy retrofits in a time of warmer temperatures. Um, some would say climate changing, and that um, heat and cold are obviously big indoor environmental quality issues. Um, what were some of the how do you look at the thermal conditions of a building? Is it just a dry bulb? Yeah, so I, I, I will I will talk about, about uh, thermal and I will let Corinne and when you want to talk about air quality. Yeah, maybe okay. you can say that. I, uh, we, we, so we for the thermal really... environment, we only talk about dry bulb. Okay, I think we need to start from, we need to go back and then the principles of tail were that we had to develop something that would be adopted by the market or would be um, applicable. So uh, in our preliminary um, uh, preliminary assumptions were just we, we could not in, in introduce the measurements that would be difficult or, uh, uh, or not possible uh, or costly, basically. Uh, so then when we are thinking about the thermal environment, of course, we would have to think about many parameters. And, uh, you know, we, we talk about four normally. So it's a dry bulb and then, of course, the wet bulb. And then we will have mean radiant and then air velocity. But as you know, to measure the um, um, humidity, um, we, we have humidity in the air quality uh, section. Okay. But uh, to measure mean radiant and air velocity is very difficult. And... Uh, how you could um, make the measurements um, uh, for that. And also, our idea was not to ne not necessarily extend the uh, number of measurements. So if we could uh, make a fairly good estimation of the effects by having um, less number of parameters uh, that we need to measure, um, we uh, decided to not to include additional parameters. So we wanted to start with a certain crude level, not to overcomplicate this measurement. Then we decided, of course, dry bulb. And, you know, in the energy um, retrofitted houses, mean radiant, there is studies that show that mean radiant temperature is very close to the air temperature. So it's because of the of the uh, envelope uh, of the house where it's just well insulated and so on so on so this is why we said okay uh, mo in most of those because it's a retrofit energy retrofit then there will be no big difference between the mean radiant temperature and the dry bulb temperature this is why we decided to have only uh, dry bulb but as Wen Juan said if we go to other climates and buildings which are probably not energy retrofitted we would have to accommodate for that we can talk about it later because we are developing tail now for schools where we also add, add additional parameters that might be are less relevant for offices, but more relevant for schools. Okay. And Dr. Mandon, did you want to add something there? Yeah, I want just wanted to say that uh, we had a first step where we reviewed all the existing indexes and parameters worldwide to uh, from already existing in green building certification. Our objective was not to reinvent the wheel or to build yeah. new, find new parameters or build new indicators. We really want it to to be. Uh, easily accessible for anybody. That's why we, we reviewed the existing knowledge. And uh, as Pavel mentioned at the beginning, we identified 90 uh, in parameters or indexes worldwide in, in, from this green building certification. And we selected a short list of 12 parameters in, divided into four components, the thermals, the acoustic, uh, indoor air quality, and light. And these 12 were chosen on based on four criteria. First, to be connected to energy efficiency, energy retrofit, because we wanted to, to see if energy retrofitted fits is not degrading indoor environmental quality. Uh, to be connect, so connected to energy, connected to health and well-being. Of course, we, we don't care about parameters that, that have no influence on comfort or well-being or, or human health. Uh, these in the parameters must be included in green building certification. They must be already known by building managers, 
by uh, building owners, nothing new. You are, people already measure them in when they have a certification, and they um, they need to be measurable, easily measurable. Afford, they must be affordable. So it's important. That's why uh, maybe we will discuss this later. This is not perfect. We could have other in parameters or more more parameters, but we want absolutely being affordable and accessible. And uh, the last criteria was uh, to have guidelines to, to, uh, to, to interpret the measurement, to be able to classify depending on the, the measured value in good category or poor category. So based on these uh, four criteria, we came to a short list of uh, 12 parameters divided into four components. Let's jump so to the... the first. The first was the thermal that Pavel has just developed. First with thermal, let's, let's jump over. Acoustic obviously is important, but I want to get to the indoor air while we have time. <laughs> um, Dr. Wei, which indoor air parameters did you choose as most important to include in tail? Well, in, in tail for indoor air quality, we chose uh, from a big a big list of parameters that we obtained from the from a literature review, as mentioned before, we uh, actually uh, come up with a list of eight parameters. So these parameters are ventilation rate, the concentration of CO2, concentration of formaldehyde, concentration of benzene, concentration of PM2.5, relative humidity, and visible mold area. And rate now as I understand, in part, you did this because the World Health Organization has guidelines for a lot of these parameters. Is that accurate to say, Paul? Well, when Juan can say that as well. Uh, um, I think air quality is an issue here. Uh, all the other parameters were simple for us. You know, um, I mean, not that simple. I, I know that for noise, we could use a different parameter, but I mean, for acoustic environment, but. You see, we have eight. We wanted to have two, maybe, or one, but we couldn't because we don't have a sort of a parameter that one parameter would characterize air quality. So what we decided is to use something that is in the standards and normally used by the industry and research, which is carbon dioxide and ventilation rate. Carbon dioxide is actually a sort of an indicator, a proxy for ventilation. It's prevalently used, this is why it's included, and then ventilation rate, if it can be measured, of course, in the mechanically ventilated uh, spaces. And then all the rest was uh, related to, uh, is, is actually um, because we have some guideline values for those, and this is why we uh, selected those, and we took them from the WHO. And then uh, mold, we had a lot of debate on mold, and uh, we can probably further discuss this. Um, but we wanted to include it because it is also it is a, a maybe not an issue in offices, but it could be an issue in the hotel rooms, and uh, you know, or or maybe in offices where there is no proper ventilation after the. Uh, energy retrofit. So this is why we thought that uh, this should be a, an important element. And it's also WHO has a guideline for, for I mean, a guideline. They, they have a guideline for mold and the uh, humidity um, in buildings, but they do not define sort of, they do not provide any guideline on what should be the humidity or what should be the mold uh, concentration or prevalence of mold on the surfaces. But we, we decided to use it because that is, as Corinne said, one of the uh, significant consequences of the energy retrofit. Maybe Corinne or Wen Juan, you want to add? Another way to explain uh, our eight parameters for indoor air quality is that uh, indoor air pollutants are very diverse. They are um, Micro microbes, biocontaminants, that's why we have mold. There are physical parameters, that's why we have radon and particles, and we have chemical substances. And among chemicals, we have uh, 
either uh, particles or gas. That's why we had benzene and formaldehyde and, and also mm -hmm. PM2.5. And since we, we cannot measure every, every all the compounds, we have these overall indicators, ventilation rate and CO2. That's that's why we came to eight, uh, eight parameters at the end to cover all the diversity of uh, indoor air pollution. Now, you mentioned you wanted this to be you know, pretty easy so people could do it fairly <laughs> easily. Um, ventilation rate is not an easy thing to measure. How did you handle that um, that conflict there? You know, you want it to be easy on the one hand, but ventilation rate may or may not be as easy as we would like to measure. I don't know who wants to jump in on that one. It's a very difficult question. I don't know whether we have an answer. I, at least I have an, not an answer to this. Mechanically ventilated spaces, uh, I think the reason why we include a ventilation rate is that it is it is in a standard. Uh, and our connection was a standard, European standards, uh, EN16798, where the ventilation rate is defined. So this is our reference. So as Corinne said, our idea was not to come up with our own guideline values. We wanted to refer to existing documents. And those existing documents is the standard that is supporting the directive, the uh, building performance directive, which is 16798. And of course, for the air quality is the WHO guideline. So uh, this is why ventilation was there included. Um, carbon dioxide in itself cannot provide us uh, with information on ventilation. And ventilation is difficult to measure, I agree, in spaces which do not have mechanical ventilation. Basically, I, 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 I shouldn't say impossible. It can be measured, but it's not easy task. I agree. How are you, how, how do you have people measuring ventilation within the, or is that not a part of this? You can. I, I don't know the, the name. I forgot it. But you, it can. If you have inlets, you can measure yes, airflow correct. rate at the inlets. So, oh, okay. and what we need to say is that we don't do measurement in all the rooms of a building. We propose to make measurements between two rooms to ten, maximum ten, in diverse places, yeah, di di different stores and different orientations, but not everywhere. So, if we select a limited number of rooms, maybe six. Maybe this can be feasible to measure the airflow rate at the air inlets in these specific rooms. So you're getting an estimate of overall, not you're you're not really getting a uh, yeah, definite. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It, it would be too expensive to measure everywhere, and uh, and moreover, our list of twelve parameters is our ideal list. I would say we are not strict absolutely if somebody cannot uh, measure one parameter because he has no he has not the device the equipment or we uh, tail can be calculated even if one parameter is not included and is missing so that's we want once again to be maybe not perfect but accessible to to all so we prefer having somebody measuring only six parameters or maybe not maybe 10 instead of measuring nothing, at least a few parameters are important. And if not all the 10, 12 are measured, it's OK, we accept. And it's already a progress. It's already uh, the billing manager is involved in this uh, topic. So it's important. Is, is anybody uh, currently using TAIL to help kind of categorize buildings? In France, I know that some people are using TAIL. Uh, we are developing TAIL for our schools, as Powell just mentioned. Okay. And uh, and some consultancy are measuring TAIL in other European country. I don't know. I know that some another European project, uh, EPS. Uh, I forgot the name. The, the project with uh, Riva Pavel. Maybe you remember. Usert, uh, I think it was the project. Usert, but, Usert, sorry, yeah. Usert pro. Uh, they, they developed an online tool to to calculate automatically tail. So some people are using tail. Maybe Benjamin uh, Babel, you you know more people. That's correct. I'm uh, sorry, uh, Corinne, for jumping in, but the our uh, the problem with tail is that we published the paper during pandemic. So uh, tail is pretty new, and uh, because of pandemic and other interest. 
uh, it was not that much disseminated. So there is more and more people learning about it. And then more and more uh, different actions are taken uh, where a tail could play a role. Um, so, for example, we are planning to measure tail in uh, our buildings on our campus at the university. Uh, so it is slowly, you know, getting out there to many other people. Uh, but uh, because of pandemic, we, we were not able to disseminate it widely. Let's stop and thank our sponsors. We'll be back. We've got Paul Wargaki, Wenjun Wei, and Corinne Mandin. We're talking about deep energy retrofits and IEQ, a European tale. Thank you. Our marquee sponsor is First On Site your trusted full-service disaster recovery and property restoration company at firstonsite.com. Association sponsors are ACGIH, Advancing Careers of Professionals in Environmental Health, Industrial Hygiene, and Safety, Interested in Defining Their Science, ACGIH.org. AIHA, Healthy Workplaces, A Healthier World, AIHA.org. The Environmental Information Association, EIA's multidisciplinary membership, collects, generates, and disseminates information concerning environmental and occupational health hazards in the built environment at eia-usa.org. The IICRC, a nonprofit standards development and certifying body for the cleaning and restoration industry, iicrc.org. The Restoration Industry Association, the oldest and largest nonprofit professional trade association dedicated to providing leadership and promoting best practices through advocacy, standards, and professional qualifications for the restoration industry at restorationindustry.org. Industry sponsors are Particles Plus, feature rich particle counters and air quality instrumentation. Count on us, particlesplus.com. Tramex meters. Developing modern dynamic moisture meters and humidity monitoring systems since 1974. Tramexmeters.com. And Healthy Indoors Magazine, a free online magazine for industry professionals and consumers. Healthyindoors.com. All right, we're back. We've got uh, a great show here on uh, deep energy retrofits and IEQ. I've got a, a cliff. Before I go any further, do you have any follow ups you want to add? No, no, but I, th I thought the test question actually was, uh, you know, the one that was in the chat was, uh, you know, w w was worthy, actually, of being posed. So I'd, like, right. I'd like to ask, ask that one. Actually, one of the listeners uh, is asking, did TAIL include overheating standards for current or future climate or extreme weather? You know, we follow the existing standards and... Uh... We are not, uh, I mean, tail can be easily adapted to the uh, new standards and new conditions. So we believe that um, it develop, the frame is developed, you know, you have to measure this and then the ranges can be e easily adapted to the requirements that uh, follow standard. Uh, okay. We have different classes and uh, of course define the certain conditions for the, um, uh that that should be obtained in buildings and um so i you know those overheating standards i don't know uh, what is meant here and in which way we are supposed to uh to address this of course we have uh, different approaches so in the for example in the non-heating season where we have a cooling pot potentially but there is no cooling mechanical cooling in a building you can follow the adaptive thermal comfort model that is also a part of the standard uh, 55 in uh, um, ASHRAE. Uh, so uh, in this way, you will be somehow, you know, uh, pro uh, have to prepared for the overheating in, in the future. Fair enough. Thanks. Joe? And I, I want to go back to some of these IEQ um, parameters, but one of the things, I, I, after looking over the papers, uh, that, that I was a little... I think might be important for our audience. Who do you envision? Let's go to Dr. Dr. Mandin on this. Um, who do you envision doing this measurement? 
um, going out and taking these kind of measurements. I mean, Powell, you mentioned maybe at a university at your university, and I would imagine you've got some research students doing that. But do you envision IEQ consultants going out and doing this kind of thing, people with the American Industrial Hygiene Association or others? Absolutely. IEQ consultants who are perfect to do these, me these measurements. Yeah, yeah. The, the, as we said several times, it's, a, it's easy. The sampling part is quite easy. And uh, we need a, a laboratory as partner, but uh, indoor air quality measurements are more and more common, at least in Europe. I, I don't know in the US, I suppose it's the same, especially after COVID. There are really more and more uh, small consultancy groups that are developing and offering uh, offering commercial proposal to do measurements. So I think it's, we, it's easy to find uh, people doing these measurements in our countries. Well, who... Who, I mean, is there an organization like here in, in the States, we have the Indoor Air Quality Association, and then there's people with ASHRAE or with AIHA. I don't know much about Europe. In Europe, is there like a an organization of these people or is it kind of more splintered? Maybe it's more scattered depending on the country, but uh, at EU level, there is RIVA, the association of uh, maybe it's, it's not only IEQ measurement, it's ventilation producer. Uh, I, I, I would say it depends on the country. There are some ISIAC chapters in, in some European countries that, are, that can disseminate this information. And, um, well, I've got a text here, maybe the AIVC. Maybe. AIV, um, yeah, I, I don't think, I, I believe that uh, in each country, Europe, uh, the, in Europe, each country will have their own institutions that they will probably, uh, if TEL is introduced as a standard metric, so then the, those institutions will probably delegate responsibility or create the new institutions that they will be performing those measurements. So, for so example, there... that would be some sort of a commissioning methods or something else that would uh, basically... Um, or the organizations uh, that there will be, you know, you do a retrofit and then after the retrofit, you will have to document that your tail is that or that, right? So that would be delegated. Uh, I think the market would develop this type of uh, services. Okay. What Corinne was saying, and I want to add once again, it can be used by the research and by the practice. But I think when, when, when we were developing it, we were thinking more to be used by the practice by the practice so uh, we didn't want to develop well, of course from the research point of view we could develop a very sophisticated tool but right. that was not our purpose our purpose was to um how to say engage the practice into this as a standard for the measurement and then we wanted to come up with something that uh, a practice could um, um, adopt and use so uh this is why you know that are not, not maybe all that you would wish to have from the research point of view, all the parameters, but practice does not want to have too many par parameters to measure. So uh, we didn't want to reduce the quality, by, but we wanted to keep it simple. This is what I'll uh, once again want to repeat. So our, our target is pra practical implementation of that um, rather than the um, uh, research. But of course, researchers there, can also use it. Are there any government agencies that might be interested in using this? Yeah, at the EU level, there is the building stock observatory that is being implemented. The, the process is a bit slow to start, but uh, it's promising. Maybe, maybe you, you can tell more, Pavel, because you were involved with them recently, but we uh, we, we, we presented to this uh, to EU Commission that the Directorate of Energy, this tail, to, so that tail could be a, uh, an index included in the this this observatory in in Europe. So the, this is how we try to to disseminate uh, tail, for example. So about BSO, maybe you said do you have more information, Powell, than me? And Cliff, I know you had a follow up. Yeah, actually, it's very very similar to this uh, current question that's up there. Uh, you know, in the United States, and I suspect in Europe and around the world, uh, in, in, in new buildings, they're installing, you know, smart uh, operating systems 
systems, you know, computer technology and so on and so forth that can operate uh, various building systems and so on and so forth. And that would seem to be uh, a great way to, um, you know, utilize your system, you know, ha having different sensors and so on and so forth that are in the buildings and, uh, you know, constantly measuring and constantly uh, have the ability to change uh building systems to adjust them in order to deal with um you know high co2 or temperature or whatever um I, i've got a text here some of my customers are buying using currently available air quality sensors and finding it useful to make decisions some of them call me finally realizing they're mechanical they need mechanical ventilation another tool to help people measure should be helpful in all indoor areas. So that's a that's a good point. Um, when you design, you want to keep it simple. Um, can you use some of these low cost low low cost sensors to help you with measuring these parameters? Yeah. Yes. Th uh, thank you. That's that's a very good question. Actually, we are uh, currently working on what well, at uh, at CSV when we are doing the the national campaign of indoor environmental quality, we're actually implementing low-cost sensors on the field together with the reference instruments. So when we use low-cost sensors, the first thing to be to be assured before doing the calculation is to benchmarking the sensor to be to be sure that they measure, uh, they have good, uh, good readings on, on the measurements. And then the idea is that uh, with, with TAIL, we would like to uh, develop some kind of tool uh, some kind of a toolkit that allow us to calculate tail online uh, based on uh, online uh, based on the local sensor measurements. Pablo, so, I don't so, know so, 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 Joe, I want to say that we do not say you know you should use this sensor or that sensor. Or, or we just define this is the quality of sensors that you should use, and then you can use your sensors and then set up the the box with the sensors that will provide you with the tail. Of course, our ambition is, and we hope that we will be one day able to create a tail meter that you can just either borrow or rent or buy or whatever. And uh, but our ambition is more like you know anyone following a, a certain rules or protocol that we have defined, which can of course when in use can be further developed and improved, uh, we'll be able to make measurements. Uh, so um, so I believe that in, in, in case of TAIL, many of the now existing so-called low-cost sensors, I don't like that term, to be honest, because it suggests that this is low quality or something like that. Uh, uh, but um, Many of those local sensors can provide a good deal of the measurements for the good deal of parameters that are included in, in tail. So, which is a, a very nice development. So you can have maybe nearly whole tail by the, taking the measurements with the, um, uh, um, the sensors that are uh, available on the market. You know, I'm looking at these parameters for indoor air quality and I'm, you know, we see Ventilation rate, CO2, commonly oh, measured, know. formaldehyde, pretty commonly measured, PM2.5, commonly yeah. measured, relative humidity, common, uh, radon, fairly common, but benzene's the one that kind of stuck yeah, out at me there. Yes. Uh, yeah, why Why was that included? Um, who's our chemist here? <laughs> it was included because it's a carcinogenic for humans, uh, so it's, and it's among the, w, there is a WHO guideline. Uh, this is a compound that is regulated in outdoor air in, in Europe. There is a European directive that makes benzene mandatory to be measured outdoor. That's why it was, um, it, it, and it's a tracer of uh, car exhaust, the, so outdoor air pollution coming into the buildings uh, with, with PMs. That's why it, it was included. And, but it's true that today there is no low cost sensors measuring uh, benzene. We still need to use a standardized. Uh, sampler active active with a pump or passive uh, passive sampler we so but uh, so it's I'm kind sure of a... that if there is a need to measure benzene uh, the, the the market will will propose something soon i suppose 
So it's it, it, it gives you some idea. Is most of the benzene coming from outdoors? Because yeah, in at least in Europe, benzene is uh, as it is a carcinogen for humans. It's forbidden to add benzene in uh, in consumer products. So benzene only comes from uh, combustion, so uh, uh, car exhaust or uh, smoking or cooking or uh, uh, having a fireplace. So it's not only from outdoor. It's a trace, a good tracer from outdoor, but it's generally a good tracer for combustion. So if you smoke, if you have a fireplace, if you if you are burning candles or, or incense, uh, you can have benzene in your uh, building. Uh, you, you mentioned it's a carcinogen. Are there other health effects associated with elevated benzene? To my knowledge, uh, the critical effect is leukemia, the, so carcinogen. The, 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 I think there are other health effects, but the more critical is the carcinogenicity. Okay. Uh, Cliff, can you keep an eye on the uh, – oh, wait, here's one. In my test homes, I find benzene and ethanol always there, and sometimes at elevated levels, always at or near the top list of concentrations. Interesting, Kurt. Thank you. Um, all right, I want to kind of switch over just a little before we go to our roundup and just kind of introduce predict tail. So you, you had tail, now you've got predict tail. Um, Dr. Wei, maybe you could help us understand why, what was the need for developing predict tail after you worked on the tail project? Well, um, the tail level, tail level is determined based on the actual performance of a building. So, and the predict tail uh, level is determined based on the predicted performance of a building. So in a renovation project, during the renovation diagnostic phase, uh, measurements of these tail parameters are performed on site in these buildings that would give us the tail level before renovation. And then during the renovation design phase, uh, the, these, the tail parameters are uh, predicted uh, according to the different renovation actions that uh, that can be uh, designed, and that would provide a predicted tail level under reference operation conditions to help choosing renovation uh, strategies by the, the stakeholders or by the design, design offices. And then the last one is after the renovation work, uh, a second measurement of the tail parameters are performed on site in the new newly renovated building, and that would provide the tail level after renovation. So the tail and predict tail they were used they are used in different phases uh, during a renovation project. Now, when when we're measuring these things, is it a one time measurement, a short time, or, or are we looking at a measurement over um, days or months? I mean, how do you handle that? Well, we would like to capture the, the seasonal difference. So in the pro protocol, we suggest to measure, uh, to do me on-site measurements during the, the, the summer season and the winter season for two seasons. And in, in, the, in, 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 in case one, two measurements in, in two seasons are not uh, possible in terms of uh, economic restraints, we, we would like, uh, we choose to measure the, uh, at least one season uh, to perform the, online, the the measurements inside the buildings for duration of uh, between one week to one month, depending on the, on the pollutants. Okay, very interesting. Let's go to the roundup, John. And the roundup sponsored by TramexMeters.com. All right, look. I, I, first, Cliff, let me give you a final uh, chance at any questions or comments. I'm good, Joe. Okay, I, I have, I have a, a, an economic question here um, <laughs> <laughs> because you know that's always something that that um, you know uh, people have to measure. They have to weigh. Okay, the, the economics of doing this versus not doing it. Did you? kind of put together any estimates on what it would cost to do a tail or to do a predict tail? Sorry. <laughs> we, we, uh, we assessed the amount and we calculated that to measure, to assess tail in one building, uh, it's, it was about 8,000 euro. So approximately the same in US dollars. About $8,000. Okay. And that's for a, a, how big of a building? 
whatever the size, uh, I would say, yeah, it was about uh, maybe for five rooms. But it, there is a maximum of 10 rooms. And I think once I don't think you, it will increase the cost. But... Yeah, it does not change the, very much the cost uh, because you, what is expensive is the the, the guy coming in the building doing the measurements during uh, on Monday putting right. the, and then coming back on Friday or the next Monday so what is expensive is the, the cost of the, the person the staff so if you have one room or 10 rooms in the same building it's nearly the, the same cost so whatever the size of the building it's approximately the same cost all right this is going to be an important show for uh, Cliff's blog. Okay, and in part because we're going to put links in there to um, I, I, is tail open source. Can we put a link to it and people can get it? Right, the papers are open. Uh, okay, source. so, we, so uh, tail all the papers and papers are in open access, so we can actually show them. Okay, great. We will get those in Cliff's blog because I think that's important. And then predict tail. Is that like? Um, is that also something that will be free to people? I mean, it's it's got to be a fairly decent uh, amount of work and time put into developing that. Uh, yes, for the for 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 Predictail, actually, it's um, we use the the tools that that already exist on the market for thermal simulation, for acoustic, IQ, and the luminous simulation. So as long as the tool on the market that already exists can provide the, the data that is needed to calculate the predict tail. We don't have any restraints on the on, on selection of the tools. Okay. And as a last question, I want each of you, if you would, to kind of tell me where you see this going next. Um, you know, you've developed this, you've done the, done the work, you've got these two papers out, uh, you've got the predict tail out there. Where do you see this going next? Um, are there any governments looking to adopt this? Any building groups? Uh, are you working with other organizations like, um, you know, maybe ASHRAE or others that might be interested? Uh, let's start with uh, Dr. Wei. Let's start with you. Uh, but on our side, uh, after this Aldrin Tail project, we have launched a PhD student who is working on adapting the tail uh, to the French uh, to 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 French schools and testing the performance uh, based on the French national database of of school IEQ environment and this PhD has been launched for uh, three years and it's it's getting finishing soon and we're 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 thinking about uh, launching other uh, projects after this uh, so this is an ongoing work at CSB site it seems like schools would be a really uh, a big focus for you because you know there's there's money going into schools to do energy upgrades and when we're doing that it's really important that we focus on IQ so I, I see that as a, a big area for you um, what would be next uh, let's go to Dr. Wargaki right um so it's an ongoing development of tail, of course, to adapt it to other buildings, as Wen Juan said. From my point of view, I can tell you that um, I don't know how much I can say, but anyway, we we hope that it will be adopted in uh, or in, included in one of our standards in Europe. So we hope that uh, when it is uh, coming into a standard, it will be then. Um, more, um, how to say, used by the by the practice. So our aim is to basically have it included in one of our standards. This is one of our objectives here. What, in your what standard, like the World Health Organization? Well, we have or... this EN one six seven nine A that is supporting energy retrofits of buildings, and uh, that is a revision of that standard. And that is the discussion with the convenors of the because it's been divided into different co uh, convenor groups. But there is a uh, there is a, um, a, a undergoing discussion to include tail into the uh, into the standard. Interesting. And, and Dr. Mandin, how do you see the future? In my opinion, the, the process can be slow, but I'm sure that tail or maybe an adapted tail will be part of the regulation or in the future. I'm, I'm sure because we are at a key moment where we are uh, retrofitting the buildings massively because we need to save energy. And uh, we rate as the attention is was raised on indoor air quality and indoor environmental quality after COVID. So we, we have these two, these two events, energy performance and health 
needs and health expectations. So we are at this key moment that people are expecting these easy indexes to, to have information to improve building. So I'm sure that tail will, will evolve positively. And uh, in France, the, gov the French government is thinking of uh, creating a new label uh, on additional criteria for the buildings. So in addition to energy performance, they want to add criteria about water resources uh, saving, about biodiversity <clears throat> saving. And they, are, they have included a, a topic on indoor environmental quality and they have they are considering tail to, to be included in this new label. This new label, it's, it will be a long process because the, the objective is to have a label in uh, 2030. So in in seven years. So, so I'm optimistic for, for the future of tail. Excuse me. Um, I got two questions. I don't know if we'll have time for both, but let, let's, let's do one real quick. And, and that is of all these parameters here, uh, we'll stick to the indoor air quality and, and uh, not worry about the T A and L, which are you individually most concerned about when it comes to these deep energy retrofits? Where do you see the most potential for problems when we do a deep energy retrofit? Let's start with Dr. Wargaki. Uh, I think uh, I, in dollar quality, this is what I see the, the, the biggest challenge. And then T will be soon coming also as another challenge. Because uh, what you said is uh, is an overheating issue. I mean, energy retrofit is to make the uh, the building losing less energy, right? But uh, what if if it's too hot, right? So, so I think that that that, to, that those two. It the quick answer. We don't have time to talk about this, but uh, I and T, I would say. All right, and Doctor Wei. I fully agree with the with Pavel. And this is uh, this is also what we saw as a prelim preliminary results that we, we we saw in in our database that the temperature could be an issue in uh, in quite a, a high percentage of 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 buildings, and also uh, uh, for for the indoor air quality it could be some parameters like CO two and PM two point five that could be a a, 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 a a problematic issue in 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 certain buildings. Okay, Doctor Mandan. Yeah, I agree. I would say mold and radon because it was already observed that in retrofitted buildings there were there were problem with mold and uh, and radon. So and temperature, of course, in the context of climate change, this might be uh, an issue. This is and an issue. Before we go, we always like to make sure you have the last word. Uh, let's go around around to each of you. And is there anything we missed or anything you'd like to add, or do you want to suggest something we should do in the future? Uh, let's start with Paul. Um, I think we said everything. One one point that I want to make very quick is that we want to put economic value on tail. So stay tuned when we have it. So, <laughs> okay. you know, you have different classes and the, when you go from one class to another or what is your economic benefit in terms of, you know, health effects um, and the cost for that and also in terms of the productivity of learning. Very important. Very important. Everybody's, you know, You've got to look at what the economic impacts are. Uh, Dr. Wei? Uh, I, I would say on my side, I, we would like that the people just try it, use it, and then uh, tell us if you like it. Very good. And Dr. Mandon? I would say that we need to have a holistic view on the building. We have, uh, we need absolutely to combine energy performance and health and comfort performance. We, people working on energy, need absolutely need to think of uh, IEQ and, uh, and we need to all push to to make building uh, more performant and healthier. I'll tell you, it's very interesting. I I learned a lot just trying to get ready for today. Um, didn't even know this existed until Paul told me when we were at the uh, home chem or the indoor indoor environment chem there. Mm -hmm. And um, I found it very interesting. It hasn't gotten enough focus. And that's part of what we tried to do today is just get the word out to people that this exists. Take a look at it. See what you think. I know you're open to ideas about ways to make it better. So we appreciate all three of you joining us today and uh, getting the word out on, on tail. And uh, we appreciate it once again. This is Radio Joe saying thanks to Paul Wargaki, Wenwen 
way, Corinne Mandan, and my co-host, the Z-Man, Cliff Slotnick. John, you got to have faith at the controls, most importantly, our audience and sponsors. We're going to take a little break for Christmas. We'll be back after the holidays with the next episode of IAQ Radio Plus. For IAQ Radio, I'm Spike Reel saying thanks for listening. 